king over anyone else on Easter Sunday. Good morning and welcome on Mothering Sunday to our worship. We're delighted that you can join us and we pray that uh, whether you're at home or here in the worship area, we'd sense God's presence and be able to worship as we are permitted. Isaiah, or God through the prophet Isaiah, says this, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. And so we come this morning wanting to praise the God who is beyond compare. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Oh, my God. 
of quiet. Perhaps you want to uh, think of one attribute of God you want to praise him for, or something he's done this week that has been an answer to prayer, that you can barely contain yourselves. You're full of praise. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Indescribable, uncontainable. Our God is worthy of praise. Uncontainable God, we praise you. We praise you for your surpassing greatness. We uh, praise you for your great love for us. Perhaps in a moment of quiet, you'd like to take one of the words we looked at last week, that God exchanges something of our dross for his goodness and just thank God for his indescribable love for us. We thank you that you pour Christ's riches into our lives for the poverty that we once enjoyed before the cross. Let's respond to the goodness of God through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're in the worship area, feel free to be seated, but we're going to continue in prayerfulness as we've been encouraging people who speak a a foreign language to uh, uh, lead us in the Lord's Prayer in that language. Uh, So I've uh, nobbled one of my friends who uh, speaks Tajik. And uh, they're going to read the passage uh, from uh, the Bible where the Lord's Prayer comes from. Thank you, Donald. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 15. Mato Bobishashu Oyati nu to pons da Paspa in Mazmundu Ogrien E Padarimo Kidar Osmoni Ismitu Mokadas Bol Malakuti tu Bioyan Erodai tu Chunon Kidar Osmonas Dar Zamin Hamba Amal Oyan Risku ruzi moro imruz ba mo bide ba kars hoi moro bibaksh chunun ki mo nis ba kars doroni hud me bakshem ba moro ba os moish du jor nakun ba ki moro az iblis rahoi de zero ki malakut ba kuat Va jalo to abad as oni tust. Amen. And so let's pray for Tajikistan. Amazing God, we thank you that in an increasingly hostile Islamic country, people are finding you. We pray for a continued openness to spiritual matters and for heads of households to be reached and their families to follow you. We pray for growth in the maturity of the church through discipleship. Hear their desire for spiritual parents that will understand the local culture and be willing to walk alongside them. We pray against the persecution for conservative Muslim communities do not tolerate change of religion. We hear the numerous heartbreaking stories of followers of Jesus cast out by their families and communities. Lord, bless them, provide for them, be their all-sufficient help in these times of trouble. We pray for courage to be given to church leaders when the secret police question them and demand they inform on other believers. We pray for the country of Tajikistan, desperately poor, still recovering from independence and civil war. As many leave the country to find work elsewhere, we pray that you would prosper the country, that people might not have to leave. Families wouldn't break down and be displaced, but communities would be strong and healthy and have a hope and a future that is rooted in your love. Bless Tajikistan in Jesus' name. Amen. As we said right at the very beginning, it is Mothering Sunday. Uh, Some of us, our mothers have passed on, uh, but we all know a lady. I can't quite get a response from the congregation, but I can see it in their eyes. We all know a lady, so we're going to make a bookmark for our mothers. Uh, or some significant other lady. And you should hopefully have got a note to uh, bring to worship a uh, lollipop stick and a piece of paper. Those of you in church, you'll see that your paper is a different pattern either side. You need to decide which side you'd like to make your heart. And that needs to uh, be kind of face down. And you want to fold it in half along the diagonal. Fold it in half along the diagonal. Okay. Okay. And then unfold it. 
and bring the top piece halfway down to the crease line. Okay? So it should look something like that. So that's the top one down, fold down to you in the, in, uh, to the crease line. And then the bottom one, fold right up to the top. Yes. Okay? I'm doing the easiest heart I could find on the internet. Some of you who are good at origami will know very complicated hearts, but uh, couldn't quite do that. Are we there? And then you need to take this corner and down the bottom there, this corner, and fold it to the top of your point. Okay? Oh. We've got some oars from over there. Okay? And you know what's going to happen as the next one? Repeat. So you should have uh, two, uh, two pointy bits at the top. Yeah? Uh, my, my, my wife needs a private origami lesson after the church service. <laughs> And then flip it over. So that, that's my backside of my origami before anyone says anything else. And slightly fold over each tip. So fold over like that. Just fold over the tip slightly towards you. Okay. And fold over the extreme corners a bit. That bit. This corner. Yeah. 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 Okay. Some of you will have a stick of glue on your chairs, and it's worth just gluing the flaps uh, flat. But you can see that's now your heart. It's really easy, isn't it? <laughs> glue the flaps down. Glue the heart onto the stick. And uh, you should also have some pens just to kind of uh, make your stick look pretty. There should be a glue. Oh, I, I, I've got one here to share with you. Do you need it sterilising before it comes your way? <laughs> so you just need to stick it on like that and you should have your heart. And uh, should just fit in your book like that just for your mums to remember that they're loved as they read their book. If uh, if you need any, no, you, yeah, yours is yours is backwards. Great. Which way did you glue it on? Should I give you another minute to finish off here? How are you doing at home? Oh yeah. Don't know. They're not talking to me from home. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. I know the family's had uh, sticks and uh, paper. Oliver sent them out. Thank you. Well, Poppy's is looking good. Karen, I think you're going to get lots of uh, <laughs> lots of bookmarks. <laughs> Great. We'll just give you a, another thirty seconds. And let, let's join together in prayer. In Jesus' name, we bless all those 
that have been blessed with the privilege of being mothers, that they would continue to deepen their love for their children and spiritual hunger to see them raised as disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray for those of us who are children, that we would honour our mothers, that all may go well in the land. We bless those that would have loved or are struggling to become mothers, that you would give them the desire of their hearts, and through your favour, they would find shalom. We pray for those who are parents, for whom depression is overwhelming, sleepless nights never-ending, and the responsibilities deeply challenging. Lead them to a place of peace and a place of enjoyment. We pray for those children whose experience of their mothers is less than it should be. Heal the scars, remove the trauma, bring them through to a place of wholeness where they're able to hope again. We recognise the cry of Rachel in the natural, give me children or I die. We pray for all women at Teddington Baptist Church that they would have spiritual offspring, a generation that looks up to them as their spiritual parents. Bless them with a passion for the lost. We pray that each one would reach one this year, that one of the people on their Take Five list would confess Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord. For your glory we pray. And we want to carry on praying, especially last night as we have seen the images this morning of the Sarah Everard vigil, that streets would be safe places for women and, and young girls to walk that the police would understand the outcry surrounding their handling of the vigil and the difficulty to strike the balance between protecting our safety and allowing people to express their grief at this time. Lord, we pray for a move of your spirit upon this nation a return to you and to your values that uh, honours people. We pray for our daughters, that they would be fearless and fulfil your destiny for them. We pray for our sons to grow up as gentlemen, honouring all within society. We pray that this will be a safe and a prosperous place for all children to fulfil their God-given potential. We pray on this Mother's Day that mothers and children would thrive. For your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. And we recognise whatever our experience, God is the greatest parent of all. And he longs for us to come under the shadow of his wings and experience his uncontainable, indescribable love. So we're going to recognise his love for us as we sing, I see your face.
Oh, Father, we uh, acknowledge that you're such a good God. And when we walk with you all the days of our life, there is a peace that transcends all circumstance. And we thank you for the privilege of knowing you this morning, of enjoying your blessing in our lives both through the good times, the green pastures, and the difficult times, the dark valleys. We thank you for your presence with us. Amen. Please do be seated, and uh, by way of video, we've got our reading, hopefully. John 14 verses 8 to 11. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Well, thank you, Randy. You should, uh, over the course of the week, got some notes for this series. I would encourage you to bring them to church if you uh, have got them. I know some of you are ferreting for them. We're going to look at session one this morning, and uh, the notes section is on page four. Um, What we're looking at over the course of the next seven or so weeks is instead bless, that's your job to bless. You'll be a blessing and also get a blessing. And this call as Baptists to be a priesthood of all believers and not just to pray for the world but speak God's blessing into the world. And this material has been written by Roy Godwin, and rather than Oliver and I rehash it, we're just going to play the videos he's recorded. Some of you I know have already read The Great Outpouring, uh, which was the first book he wrote based on his experience at a Welsh retreat centre called Faldi Brennan. Now, I really don't like reading. I find it hard work. And I I know some of the leadership team feel a bit like me, but when we read the book, we read it from cover to cover. We couldn't put it down. It was so compelling, the story. So I would encourage you to think about reading it over the course of the next seven or eight weeks. Uh, If you do read it, uh, you won't put it down. (laughs) You'll finish it in a day. If I can finish it in a day... Well, I think some of you finished it in an evening. Uh, It was that easy a read. Um, It won't last seven or eight weeks. It'll just be a blessing to you. So uh, feel free. I think we've got several copies, haven't we, Hilary? I I, I know I have three or four copies and I've given them all away. Well, I lent them. I just haven't got them back at this present moment in time. So I can't offer you my copies because... I can't, I never remember who I lend books to. It's a bad thing, and I often don't get them back, but that's fine if it blesses you. The course is actually based on his second book, The uh, The Way of Blessing. You don't need to read it. Hopefully everything we've contained in the notes is sufficient. So uh, I'll hand over to Donald, and if you could uh, run... Hello, welcome to Falder Brennan in South West Wales. I'm Roy Godwin, and we're going to look together at the Blessings course. This is session one. 
I hope you've managed to read the relevant passages in my book, The Way of Blessing. And if you haven't, you have a choice of stopping and going away and reading it or carrying on. You don't have to have read it to be able to do this course. We're here in the day room at Falder Brennan, which is full of stories of the wonders that God has done. What I'd like to do in this first video is consider who God is. It's very, very interesting that the Bible never attempts to persuade us that God is there, but it does tell us a great deal about him, helping us to know him and understand him. One of the ways that it's able to do that is that God himself likes to reveal himself to us. And so he's spoken to us and he's displayed his nature to us so that we can begin to understand who he is. Somebody once said that if you put a hundred people in a room, there would be a hundred ideas of what God was like. Well, we all have a reason for leading us to a view of what God is like. And it seems right to us, but actually it may be right, it may be wrong. Because there are many things that can influence the way that we consider God and think of him. For me, for instance, I had a very, very difficult relationship with my own human father. He was profoundly deaf. He had many, many failings, as do I. But growing up as a child, it was very difficult indeed. When I began to search for God and to understand him, I found myself wanting to go away and shout to make myself heard. It's easy to take that back. And remember, my father was deaf. It was hard for him to hear me. Actually, he wasn't very interested in hearing me. So I carried that through into my idea of God. I was talking once with a farmer and I mentioned to him that God is a father. And the farmer turned to me angrily and said, no, he's not, he's a mother which quickly led to the disclosure of uh, deeper difficulties in his appreciation as a child of his human father. But actually we may have had an excellent father, but even so that excellent father is not a picture of God who is a father. So how can we really know what God is like? Well, the Bible helps us. We read some words that you may know well in John chapter 14 and verse 8. Philip, one of the disciples, spoke to Jesus and said, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on accounts of the works themselves. He means the many miracles, of course, that he's been conducting. Jesus is making yet again an extraordinary claim about who he is. He's saying that to ask to see the Father is nonsense if we've seen Jesus, because having seen one, you've seen both. They are absolutely identical. The writer to Hebrews in chapter 1 speaks of Jesus in verse 3, he says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Isn't that extraordinary? He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. If we really want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. And when we do that, we listen to his words, and we see his deeds, and we take in his teaching, 
and we discover that he has said everything he says and everything he does is because it's what he hears the Father saying and what he sees the Father doing. There is no difference between them. So what has determined your idea of God? And what do you think he's like? How do you relate to him? In the Old Testament, there's a recurrent word that is used so strongly and clearly from beginning to end that if you could only take one word out of the whole of the Old Testament and say, does that summarize the Old Testament? You'd probably say yes. It's a Hebrew word, chesed. And the English Standard Version, which is the version that I'm using uh, throughout these talks, translates chesed as steadfast love. And it's an excellent translation and it's consistent and it occurs throughout the Old Testament. And it speaks of God who has decided that he is going to love us. Not because we are lovely, we tend to be messed up. The Old Testament is full of real people, real stories, of real sins, of failure, of disaster, of rebellion, of weakness. But in spite of that, God has simply said, I'm going to love them and love them and love them. I'm going to love them with all my love. I'm going to covenant to love them. And there is nothing that is capable of stopping or moving or diminishing that love. That's what we mean by grace. That God gives to us what we could never, ever deserve. But a word that then carries on through the New Testament in particular is the concept of blessing. And we discover that God blesses us. Well, he blesses us his, with his steadfast love. He's committed himself to us. But in that grace, he never treats us as we deserve. He certainly never treats us according to what we could do to make him love us or favor us. He just gives and gives. That's his nature, to look at us, to affirm us, to pour love and acceptance into us, to give his spirit to us, to give us life, to give us salvation, to set us free as people, to enable us to come and know him. So the Bible speaks of a father who will never stop loving, never stop giving, and who desires to bless us from beginning to end. But what does it mean to say that he desires to bless us? Well, the word that is most commonly used uh, is translated into English rather like this. It means that God wants to give us an incredible increase in favor. He wants us to grant us prosperity, not simply in terms of money, but in relationships, in the richness of life. And he wants to enable us to enjoy victory over anything that oppresses us. That's what it means to bless us. This is what God is like. A little while ago, we had a conference at Felderbrennan, and we had somebody sitting a little way behind me. And before every session, he would come up to me and say, excuse me, would you mind praying for me? And I would say, well, just wait until the end of the session when we're doing the ministry because we're just starting now. And he would do it at every opportunity. And then when it came to the, uh, the final rather explosive celebration event where God was moving so powerfully, many people, scores and scores of people responded for ministry, but he stayed in his seat. So I spoke to him afterwards as people were leaving and saying, is all well with you? And he said, oh my goodness, it is. I said, why? What makes it so well? And he said, well, you see, I've been seeking to follow Jesus and believing and trusting in God for nearly 40 years. But today I've looked at the Bible and seen who God is and he isn't who I thought he was and I now like him. I want to follow him, and I've just recommitted my life to him. This is the God I've always longed for. I think all of us find it challenging to examine our presuppositions about what God is like, 
by going back and looking at what Jesus has said and what he has taught. A story we all know very well, of course, is the story that we call the story of the prodigal son, where the son has taken the money that would have been his inheritance early, gone off into a far land, left his older brother behind to look after the business, wasted the money, and then found the need to go back home. But as he sets off home, he knows full well that he's lost any rights that he had to be honored as his father's son, and was prepared to go back and grovel and confess his failures and ask simply to be welcomed onto the edge of his father's community. But what he didn't know was that the father was waiting for him. He was looking for him. He was desperately longing for him. And the moment he saw his son approaching, he rushed to meet him, letting go of all decency and decorum, shocking the servants that would have been around, grabbing the son who would be smelly and dirty, hugging him, holding him. And there's the son trying to say, Father, I've sinned against you. I am not worthy to come into your house again as your son, but just let me be as one of the hired servants. And the father sweeps it away. He's heard the son's confession, sweeps it away and says, quick, hurry up, hurry up, fetch new cloaks, uh, new shoes to put on his feet, a ring to show that he belongs to me on his finger. Let's have a feast. My son who was lost is found. That's only one part of the story and one part of the richness of the story that Jesus is telling. But it gives us an insight into the role of Jesus coming on behalf of the Father to call the lost children to come back. And of course, that's what he's doing for you, just as what is what he's doing for me to call us back, to welcome us, to come into the Father's household. And he has a ring for you and a ring for me. And that ring of belonging, of adoption, of course, is the Holy Spirit that Paul writes of as an engagement ring, a deposit towards a fullness of relationship. Well, as you look at the scriptures and consider that God, the Father, is exactly a reflection of Jesus, the Son, maybe that will challenge some of your ideas of what he is like, how you might approach him. Have you ever considered that Jesus is gentle, mild, soft, loving, caring, whereas the Father is an angry judge? Well, the scriptures bring you back into line then. Because the Jesus that we experience, the Jesus we see recorded in the scriptures, is the exact imprint of the Father's nature. Let's just be quiet for a moment and just reflect on what we've heard and how God may be challenging us and the impression we have of him and how he may want to rebuild in our lives a much more positive and healthy image of who God the Father is. Father, we pray as we read our Bibles, as we talk together over the course of this week, Lord, you would build up a greater understanding and appreciation of who you truly are, of how deep your love for us is and how passionate is your desire to bless us, particularly in our relationship with you, that you would want to pour healing and restoration 
so that we are part of your family and enjoy your lavish favour. Lord, as we go through this course, Lord, open our eyes to the ministry of blessing, not because we're great, but because you're great, and call us to walk this world as a priesthood of all believers. Amen. So we're going to sing the blessing. Peace. 
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Did you know that the Lord is more for you than you could ever imagine? Isn't that staggering? He's for us more than we could ever hope or imagine. So great is the love of the Father for us. If you're at home on your own, you might like to imagine someone, but if you're at home with someone, you might like to look at them. If you're here in the worship area, you might like to look at someone reasonably nice and speak the words of the blessing over them. Uh, Not literally. Metaphorically, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord is for you. Amen.